Thank you and good evening and welcome to the finest, friendliest and warmest and nicest church in the city of London. <laughs> and the best uh, in the Anstar Consistory Court in uh, November 1706, Bach, who was a trouble for everybody all his life, was reprimanded and asked why he had caused what was called a friendly young man, a strange young woman, to uh, be invited into the choir organ gallery often and to make music there. And I have got a strange young woman after the organ gallery <laughs> <laughs> to make music for me. Uh, but if you thought you were just going to be inactive in the end or wrong, because I need you to be the congregation of the new church in Amstel in Bath's lifetime, you would have found a sheet of music when you came and sat on your seat. Share them around, because I need you to sing this chorale. And we have a congregational practice, first of all. Persuade the city court in Amsterdam 
I want to persuade you that that journey was worthwhile. I want to ask you in a sense why he did it, what he got out of it, what difference it made to his music and therefore to all the music came to sport. And by the end, I hope you can answer the question because I don't think I can. What did he actually do with Lubeck? Did he actually have investment books to Lubeck? Or did he just take part of the art of music that in Advent, the son of Advent, it was famous that books who had instituted a series of concerts on the son of Advent and the money of the day, the art of music. The year in which Bach went was the year in which the most famous temple of musical was produced. And when you went to the Marion Cake in those days, on the West Wall was this enormous and magnificent wall. And around the centre were all these galleries, four galleries, all filled with musicians, making concerted music. It was the wonder of North Germany at the time. It really was. They were just magnificent affairs. So you can imagine the temptation of the bark to do the great journey. Imagine you're a 20 year old, or somebody probably up, and you're sitting one night in the pub, and all of a sudden your friend says, oh, come on over here, Mark, come over here, you know, I'll drink with us. Oh, by the way, what are you going to do for Christmas this year? Oh, I'm going to walk to Lynn. What the hell? Oh, to hear this wonderful man, books to do that. I'll tell you what, uh, I've got a piece of his on my iPad here. <laughs> uh, listen to this.
that gets your attention straight away. It's the combination of rhythm, of the drama, the drama of the order that makes it sound everywhere. And you think the order of nine there, it had prospects of 32 foot pipes, had pipes at the side, and then a heart there from the over there, and the shell there, and very close to the rock positive, using all these different parts of the order, like a stereo machine. This sound coming from everywhere would be astonishing this day. Absolutely amazing. Some reason to go. If he had been Christmas time too, he would have heard Christmas chorales and the importance of the chorales and in Dorky Yumino, so here comes your chance. This is what Bach <coughs> might have heard. This is books that he was played on Dorky Yumino. And at the end, I think you have to sing. Because it's a new great church, they sang unaccompanied. This is the moment you've waited for all the <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you hear what books and who it does, and you don't believe it, and then you've got to try your best.
accompanied the chorales, expected people to sing with them. It was the way we should do it in many parts of Europe at the time. There was a wonderful collection in the library of Dulwich College, just over the South East 21, of the accompanists of John Redding, when he was in the 18th century, the accompanist to the organist at Dulwich College, how he accompanied English hymns, the same style. What happens is you sing one line, then there's a sort of happening. Then you sing another line, and there's another happening. And so on. So you get the idea, don't you? The thing is that Bach, the young Bach, was rather good at the happening bits. <laughs> he was also rather good at putting the most unexpected harmonies underneath notes. Now you're on your own. You've got to do the best you can. <coughs> this is Armstadt, 1706. Think how old you were in 1706. You've got to have a little puff for this one. And Harry will give you the first day of the PHR, the part of the we and we'll see how we get on. This is an authentic performance. <laughs> you can go wrong before the end. Those who make it to the end of the prize. Can I have an A, please? Church was always full. Everybody came to church. The point of the 
this was, when the service was allegedly beginning, he had to make a big, big noise that everybody would know at the beginning. It was saying that again. We do the same like in weddings nowadays, actually. <laughs> in between, he had to carry on the corrals. The important thing to remember is that in those days, none of you would have been able to read or write. You had to learn everything by heart. All the corrals you know the text by heart. And they didn't sing an enormous number of them. And every service out there, there were some of the same corrals. It meant the same corrals all the way through. There was a sort of small corpus of these things <coughs> which they knew, but the texts were in their heart. The idea of the particular idea was that you have a good tune. Why should the devil have all the best tunes? They should have a good tune to sing, and they are all good tunes. You don't you were those wonderful tunes, and you did all right. They're beautiful and wonderful tunes, but the important thing is not the tune. It's the words and what the words mean. It's not the same as the Hintang Kamon, where you may switch the tunes around. Every chorale had one tune. So they learned them from the cradle to throw. What the organist had to do with the cradle was not therefore to introduce the tune, because everyone knew what the tune was. Perhaps to give them a pitch that they were singing that. What he had to do was to make a picture, as it were, of the meaning of the text. I've just chosen one chorale for tonight. And we'll call them, I have entitled the Great Advent Chorale. Bach must have heard this when he made that thing, because he went to that thing. At every single service, there were some, non call them, I have entitled. Now comes the saviour of our race. It's a wonderful, wonderful chorale. And here's the very books in the world. The thing you have to listen for, and to remember if you can, the last eight bars. You've got to remember the last eight bars. This is a physically a wonderful right hand solo, almost like a harmony solo, with incredible harmonies underneath. The harmonies of the divine imitation of the Quran. Everything is missing, the whole thing is there. And by the end, you've got the idea of the Saviour coming down to earth this time. Imagine the music as a stained glass window. Imagine the whole thing, and by the end, you've got the story. So here it is, books to do. Oh, 
increase the pain, which is quite amazing at the end. The most amazing thing is the last eight bars.
here talk to you. It's a unique way of writing a Kabbalah trilogy. It's one of the books that's a pure Greek. The books who have been there, they the bar. We know that the people round about in the third of the ring here, they did write Kabbalah trilogies like that. That proves nothing else what you learnt in that war. The other thing the authors had to do was the Primudium. The thing about the Primudium was that it was the glory of our order. It really was. Uh, it had to be dramatic. It had to have contrasts. It had to have rhythm. It had to have vitality. It had to show off the beast of the order, the glory of the king of instruments, if you like. It had to use the entire stereophonic possibilities of orphans on the west wall facing down the church, making wonderful, wonderful sounds. It had that color, it had that enthusiasm, and everything. And Bart got told off all over the world. They said to him, the organist Bart had previously played rather too long. <laughs> but after his attention had been called to it by the superintendent, he had immediately fallen on the other extreme and made it too short. <laughs> All this still do it to this very day. And with my rector sitting here, we're going to have to be very careful. <laughs> the great thing about the Protestant Church of North Germany was, of course, that when the organ music began, the priest walked in and sat down and listened to the piece. And when it was finished, then he began the service. So it was too long, and I've got two cards sitting there. So there you are. Bach had the model at the time of the great ranking in the Catholic Church in Hamburg. The Catholic Church in Hamburg at the time had perhaps the finest order of that part of Germany by a long way. And Rankin, when he finished his job, he was 100 years old. So he was the doyen of our authors today. He was greatly, greatly admired. He also had Gail Bohm in Louisville, where he'd been the first <coughs> old father who were great to play these enormous presence of views. And so Bach obviously took this immense span. And then after Superintendent told him off, he thought it was right, okay, short one. Here it is. This is Bach being short at the time. <laughs> No, 
remember in those days that people always played their own music. They didn't really play other people's music. All the music which Bach wrote, he wrote for himself to play. And Foxman, all the music he wrote for himself to play. If you were sitting there as a pupil, the way you learned was by sitting in the heart's footsteps, really. If you were sitting there and thought it was a good piece, you'd then go and write it down. You would do, as it were, musical dictation. Most of Bach comes down to us in copies made by his pupils. Very little in his own hand. They were able to do this. So you got to do it right now. So Bob said, OK, Bach, we have to play one of your pieces. So he played that piece. So let's see where it goes wrong. Well, it begins with something like that. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that's very good. People will probably listen to that. That's all right. And then you've got the pedal there. Well, that's all awesome. That's the key. It's in, it's in their head. Like, they've got the flashy bit. Well, if you're 20, you always do flashy bits. All 20 year olds do flashy bits. I don't want that to be that. It's very essential. And then you have a pedal solo. This is the bunch of piano and that pedal solo in the rubbish. It's a key that we can't let anyone do that. Of course, it's a flashy You really can't get away with that. And then you've got another flourish. You've just had a flourish. You've now had two flourishes and a rather poor pedal solo. And now you've got the dum dee boom ding dum dee boom ding dum. What is that? That's not really very good. Well, I thought it sounded good, sir. I thought it was really rather well good. You know, these pedals just go in a big quarter over the top there, really good. And then I turned upside down and did it on hand. I thought that was rather clever. Well, you thought this was very clever. Pretty feeble harmony, wasn't it, really? <laughs> when it comes down to it, you know, pretty feeble harmony wasn't that good. And the one part went wrong, too. And then you had a pedal solo, everything. Everybody does that. I've heard that everywhere from Bloomberg to Huxford. Everyone does that. Could you do something more special, traditional? You know. And I must be getting a bit fed up by that time, I reckon. And then the cave is where you start to try so It's quite a short piece. It's not bad for a beginner, but it's not really what it's all about. And if you're going to study with me, I think I'll tell you how you should actually write a really good Baroque tribunal. The great thing about the time you do this, the first thing you must do is to get the people's attention. Essentially, you must do something which really gets their attention. At the same time, by the end of the first bit, they must know what key they're in. Because when you start a musical journey, you must know where you start from. Because in the end, you've got to get back there. Otherwise, nobody knows the piece is finished, basically. The great thing about a piece of music is it has to start somewhere, it has to go somewhere, and it's got to come back. And you have to fit that into people's ears. So you've got to establish a very strong set of keys. So the beginning movement must set a very fine key sense into them. And this flashy piece must have something to bind it together. If it's only flashy, it's only flashy. So the easiest way I all them to do it is to have an ostinato bass. Anyone here can find anything has always thought this. Ostinato bass gets you out of any trouble whatsoever. All you need is dum 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 That will bind it all together. So this is what so this is how I do it.
put in your head now. So, fine, now what do you do next? Well, we have a fugal section. The great thing about a few musicians is that it's a sort of pattern which you have to stick to, it's like a set of rules to it. It's like driving a motor car. You've got to have a tune, first of all. Well, no, you can't actually have a tune, because a tune makes it too complicated. You've got to have a motif, which you can build something on. It's better not to have a tune, because people tend to remember it. And you have to have what you have a motif. The yeah, idea? Yeah. Coming on very well. Yeah, but this looks like it's done. I bet half the congregation fall asleep, won't they? It's just so intellectual. Most of them are peasants and beekeepers and things like that. <laughs> yeah, but that's all right. We'll get our attention back because now what we'll do is we'll do something really dramatic, really true, really different. And what's more, it's so virtuoso. Most of all, it's called players. The great thing was that Bach always had a virtuoso piece in his program that other people could never possibly play. So we've got a really virtuoso piece. No one can believe that this is going to be so good.
don't have enough fuel. This is one of the big differences between Bach and Buxtehude. Buxtehude had this enormous traumatic sense. He put pieces together in short sections, joined them all together, and made a wonderful traumatic piece that we're about to hear. Bach made continuous pieces. The thing that Bach gave to Baroque music was long music, really. Do you think that any piece of Buxtehude series of little short movements put together. Some of these things are perhaps one minute, one and a half minutes long. You put them together to get a six minute piece. You have that in the long piece. You know the big E flat friendly cue of Bach takes 14 and a half minutes to play. That's the difference. All Baroque music was short bits until Bach. Bach had this wonderful way of making an enormous span of music hold together. He had a great control, not only of melody and rhythm, but also of harmony and structure to make the pieces really stand. The big premise of the view was about 12, 13, 14, 15 minutes in length. An incredible achievement. Not equal to two days later. That was the greatness of life. This overarching sense of style. It was all based on the music he learned from books to do. We now play the whole of this wonderful prelude of the G minor. This is one of the gems of early Baroque music, one of the finest pieces of all the music to play, hopefully to listen to. It's inspiring to play this music. It's almost like being on a trampoline. It has enormous type of service, an enormous rhythm, an enormous contrast, an enormous drama. It's almost like going to King Lear and Othello all in one. <laughs> and the whole piece is really just stupendous. This is one of the great pieces of organ music of all time. This makes it worth walking 280 miles. Imagine, imagine if you had never heard the music of Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, but later people. You had only ever heard music of your own time. They didn't play all music. Music in time of your own time. So you walk that way. Freezing cold. In December 1796, in the dark, gloomy night of the you heard the amazing Dietrich Brooksfielder play this piece.
I hope the music has proved to you it was worth making that walk. What he learned, 